Victoria, would you come and do our reading for us, please? And the reading today comes from Acts 2, 1 to 21. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and other parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Now this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord." And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Victoria. A absolutely wonderful passage of scripture. And no doubt one that many of you have read and heard. Had spoken about many times, I'm sure. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you for your word and we thank you, Lord, that it is for us both an encouragement and a challenge, perhaps in equal measure. And there are fewer passages, Lord, that are more challenging than this one because if we're honest, we want to see you doing these things in our world right now. And in our part of this world, we don't see it, Lord. And we wonder why. And we ask that question. Father, I pray that irrespective of what I might say this morning, that somehow you give us some answers to those things. For your glory. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm sure many of you have read these words and heard people speak upon 
this, uh, this, this passage many, many times. But I don't think it's possible to overstate the significance of the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost. His presence in the lives of the believers changed the way that they saw everything. It changed the way that they lived. It changed the way they shared God's love. And of course it changed the world. I don't know what the world would have been like. It's pretty dire now, isn't it? What the world would have been like if those early believers had not been empowered and not gone out and shared the gospel in the way that they did and see the world change so that just 300 years later the known world was, inverted commas, Christian. But can you imagine the believers behaving after Pentecost the way they had behaved before Pentecost? Just think for a moment, the Garden of Gethsemane. What were they doing there? Lashing out with a sword, scared, frightened. When you think of it like that, it doesn't seem like it's even the same people, does it? But these people had the indwelling. These believers had the indwelling of the Spirit. And as I say, he had changed their lives completely in a moment. Because now they had the courage to stand for God. As I was writing those words, I was thinking of last week when Mike Cooper was here from Open Doors, those of you who were here remember. And then he spoke about some of the most amazing situations, the most difficult situations in the world. And one of my reactions, amongst many, I have to say, was how can these people stand so resolute for the truth through Jesus under such persecution? Why don't they cave in? Of course, the answer is that they know that God is in their lives. They know the presence of the Spirit with them. And the same was true for these disciples. And, dare I say, it can be true for us. More of that in a little later. But first, let's have a little look. And it's such a wonderful passage. There's no way I'm going to be able to um, cover everything I might like to say here. You'll be pleased to know. Mm-hmm. But there is, um, there's just some things I want to, want to draw out from this passage today. And you may well have heard these things before. And of course, that's fine. And maybe the fact that I'm saying them again is just a reminder that they're being underlined for you. Um, but firstly, note how the Holy Spirit came to the believers. They had been told, back in Luke 24, by Jesus himself, I'm going to send what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Just imagine if Peter said, nope, I don't want to stay here, this is a grotty place, I want to get back to Galilee, I want to go fishing. And the other disciples deciding they want to do their own thing. This is all finished. It's had its day. And if God wants to do something, he'll, well, he'll do something. He's capable of that. At the very least, they were obedient. They did what God said. They stayed in Jerusalem. They waited and they waited and they waited. It wasn't just one day. They waited. They were obedient. And so we're told they were all together in one place. Whether they understood what this command was to stay together, they were obedient. They would remained in Jerusalem, even without the understanding. Does God ever speak to you sometimes about things and you think, Lord, I haven't got a clue what this is really about, but I will try to be obedient in what you ask of me. You know, sometimes those are the occasions when actually we see most blessing. Obedience becomes... Uh, faith, if you like, through obedience through faith comes before we see what it is that God's doing. Secondly, there was a violent wind. And that was scary enough on its own, I'm sure. I don't know about you, but I'm not keen on the wind these days, especially violent ones. 
But somehow they knew that it wasn't just a violent wind, it was a wind that was coming from heaven. It was a heavenly wind. That's, that sounds to me even more scary, actually, if I'm honest. <laughs> it all happened so fast that they probably didn't get enough chance to be too scared about it. Because the third thing was this visible expression of the Holy Spirit. Tongues of fire. You, know, you can imagine, can't you, looking, them looking across the room. What's that? <laughs> and then somebody looking back, you've got it's on you as well. You know, when Jesus was baptised, the Holy Spirit came upon him, symbolised by a dove. Peace. Purity, innocence, and beauty. You'll find different scriptures to, to, to convey that. It's interesting that for the disciples, it was different. The Holy Spirit was symbolised by fire, representing the presence of God. And there are a number of Old Testament passages that speak about that. For example, when Moses sees the burning bush, God's presence. But here... In this passage, the tongues of fire represent not just the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, but they're a fulfilment of John the Baptist's prophecy that the Messiah would baptise with the Holy Spirit and fire. That's in Matthew chapter 3 if you want to look it up. And then finally in this part of the passage, the disciples are all filled with the Holy Spirit and begin to speak other tongues as the Spirit enabled. Why? Why was that that necessary? Probably all the people in the city could speak Hebrew. Probably. Why was it necessary that they all speak different languages? Well, firstly... And I'm sure Ina would agree with this. Sorry to pick you out, Ina. But I'm sure, firstly, if you want to hear from God, it's best to hear it in your mother tongue. When you read the scriptures, Ina, when you read them in Russian or Ukrainian, I'm sure probably God speaks to you more powerfully than you read in English. (laughs) You don't know. (laughs) Maybe you understand. Thank you. Yes, that's, that's right. Hearing these believers speak in their own tongue, in their own languages, made them sit up. These bunch of uneducated farmers and fishermen and whatever, speaking these other languages, it makes people sit up and take notice. And partly it was for that. But partly it was proof that God was doing something new, something different. He was also restoring something. You remember back to the Tower of Babel when God gave all these languages just to confuse people. Now he's saying that that confusion is gone. We've got restoration with with the people of God because of the coming of Christ, because of the resurrection and the power over death, and now the outpouring of the Spirit. We can reverse all that tragedy of old. Another reason... These languages, whether they were heavenly, and I'm sure some of them were, or whether they were earthly, and some they definitely were, were a proclamation that God's Spirit has come and will witness to these people, whoever they may be. And the second part of this passage, Peter addresses the, the crowd and conveys such a different Peter to the man that we find denying Jesus at the high priest's house, that again, you think, how can this be? But I'm sure you have met people in your life, maybe one or two, maybe not masses, but I'm sure you've met people who you've seen before and after, as in before Christ and after Christ, before an empowering of the Holy Spirit. And after. And those people can appear almost like different people, can't they? Even just their demeanour, the way they look. You think something's happened to you, hasn't it? 
that's what Peter was like. He was changed by the power of God in his life. I take assemblies. I take assemblies in this school, um, and I take assemblies at one of the other schools in um, Uckfield as well. And sometimes um, it comes up, and I can't remember any uh, the reasons now, but sometimes it comes up where I talk about the Holy Spirit. And this, the Holy Spirit is something that most children can't really get their heads around at all, um, as you can imagine. And, and so I try to put it quite simply, and I say the Holy Spirit... Well, Christians believe that the Holy Spirit is God living inside every Christian. And there's a, there's a whole gasp that goes up from the room, first of all. And things like, and they're not supposed to call out, but of course they can't help themselves. No way, really? How? That's the sort of reaction that I get. And I'd suggest to you that that's not a surprising reaction because it is unbelievable. Isn't it? Well, it would be if it weren't for passages like this, for Pentecost. And it would be if there weren't other passages in Scripture, like 1 Corinthians, for example, 6, 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you've received from God? And then in the passage today, a couple of times, being filled with the Holy Spirit. You have, friends, you have the knowledge of God, his wisdom, his authority, his power within you. You have his knowledge, his wisdom, his authority, his power within you. Not because you are, how can I say, above everyone, but because the dwelling of God is in you. Sometimes we need to just reflect on that. And if we are willing to cooperate, all those resources that he has given us, that he gave them on the day of Pentecost, can be used for the blessing of his church, but perhaps even more significantly, this world of ours. And that is why the sorts of people that Mike Cooper spoke about last week can witness to Christ's love despite the persecution. Okay, in this passage at the very beginning, even in this passage at the very beginning, we get a taunt, you know, they're just drunk. That's probably the level of, you know, persecution we get most of the time, you know, ridicule. It went on from there, of course, to far, far, far more serious things, including giving their lives for Christ. But it started on day one. But they didn't go, actually, if it's going to be like this, if we're going to get these taunts, if we're going to get this ridicule, we're not going to carry on. Because they knew God had done something that was changing the world, that had changed them. But if you're anything like me, I hear you cry. I'm not like that. I can't do that. I don't feel different. I don't feel empowered. Okay, <laughs> I get it. But let's just pause for a moment and back up. Jesus said these words in John's Gospel. He was speaking to the Jews. He said, if you hold my teaching, you are really my disciples. Great. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth of God's word, friends, will set us free. Set us free from all the things that, that we struggle with personally. The things that don't enable us to have the Holy Spirit's full control of our lives. There's another helpful passage for us when Paul writes to Timothy. You struggle, maybe? He says this. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. 
that the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel in the power of God. The Holy Spirit, one of his roles in our lives is to give us power to witness for Christ. But we have to do some work. There is a part for us to play. It isn't just to stand there and, you know, like a zombie and wait for something to happen to us. It's a corporation. It would still have been possible at any point along the right line throughout the whole of Acts and beyond. And I'm sure you can find examples, although I can't think of any specific ones now, where people could have done things that God didn't want. We still have to cooperate. This isn't just the Holy Spirit's work. It is a cooperation. Peter reminded the believers of this. He said, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Because that's the other extreme, isn't it? The Christians just blunder in, you know. I'm full of the power of God. I do, you know, I'll tell you, the, I'll, I'll give you everything, both barrels in one go, right in your face. And then what do those people do? They wander away thinking, I'm, I'm not having anything to do with people like that. We have to work with the Spirit of God. We have to know the Scriptures and work with the Spirit of God. It's, it, it, It's this threefold thing again, isn't it? Us, the Holy Spirit, and God's Word. Working together to seek what he wants us to do. When I, the first, no, the second Sunday when I came to this church, um, the Sunday when we were thinking of coming and being part of the fellowship, I was given a passage to speak on Uh, about evangelism. In fact, it might even have been, it might even have had that 1 Peter verse that I've just mentioned. And at the time, I brought with me copies of the book, Sharing Jesus. Some of you may still have them. I hope you have. If you've got them, dust them off. Um, Because the only way we are going to see God change things is if we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And to do that, We have to prepare ourselves for whatever he might want in terms of sharing with others. And I hear so many people say to me, I wouldn't know what to say to somebody who asked me about my faith. Friends, that book, that Sharing Jesus book, has got lots of helps in it. And if you've lost it or you didn't, or if you've arrived here, and that's the truth for most, a lot of you actually, um, you have arrived here since then, I can let you have another copy. We want to be able to witness in the power of the Holy Spirit, but we need to know what to say. You might say, well, how did Peter know what to say when he stood up there in front of the crowd? Well, actually, he was a good Jew. He may not have understood the testimony about Jesus way back before all that happened, but he knew the scriptures, and the Holy Spirit then brought them to mind when it came to the point of speaking out to the crowd and the others along the way, whether it was Stephen or Paul or whoever, they used that knowledge that God had given them. And we, used, we need to do that as well. And if we struggle with that, we need to get into the Bible. We need to get help. Friends, the question really then is, are we serious about being empowered believers? Do we want the power of a changed life? Will we allow God's Pentecost blessing to overflow from us to others? You know, if we keep it all inside us, we'll be like a a pond that has no fresh water flowing through as we become stagnant. Then we'll have no ability to share. Are we willing to step out in God's strength to share the message 
that he has given us? These are the big questions that Pentecost throws at us. God is willing. Absolutely. He hasn't changed. He's never changed. So the determining factor in this is our response. If not, then what's the point of Pentecost? Let's pray. Father, if we're honest, we like the idea, we like the excitement of uh, the outpouring of your spirit into the lives of those believers. Those signs, those visible signs of many languages, of tongues, of fire, of wind, the rushing wind. We like those things, Lord, they're exciting. And yet, Lord, we know that beyond this passage, those early disciples, they got down on their knees and came back to you again and again and again and got up and went and stood up for you in the marketplace, in the temple courts, right around the Roman world and suffered for it. Lord, I don't know what you'll do with us, but please make us willing to serve you in the power of your spirit not in our own strength, in the power of your spirit, for your glory. Amen. Amen.